Happy Easter to all of you. Let's say praise the Lord. Lord. I will say the Lord is risen. You will say the Lord is risen indeed. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. The Lord is risen. Amen. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. No matter what men may say, we know He lives. Let's sing this great hymn together. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever men may say, I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always here. He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives. Let's sing the chorus again. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You
say amen. amen. You may be seated. Paid my 
blessed Easter to each and every one today, from all of the pastors and the associate staff, from the elders and the deacons, and all the members of the ministering groups, the Chance of Choir, and all the children's ministries, all of us who make up this wonderful, loving congregation, we welcome you in the name of the risen Lord Jesus, whose name is above every name. And our hearts do what the scripture says every man will do someday. We bow before him and we declare that he is Lord to the glory of God. If you are with members of family and uh, it's an unusual happy time because you're together today, uh, we give loving greetings as well. Uh, just for a minute, we won't stand, but I think it's a joyful time as well. The Bible speaks about the fellowship of the saints. Let's turn and just say hello to somebody that you didn't greet when you came in. Just for a minute. And wish everybody a happy Easter. We would like to uh, send you a personal greeting. I would. A personal greeting from me and from the staff. If you're here on this uh, Easter Sunday... If you'll put your name on one of those comment cards or visitor's cards or greeter cards, I believe they're in the rack in front of you. And uh, you could help us, too, by saying, I came to Calvary because if you're with a family, that would tell us something about family life. If you heard about us or you just went by and you said, what is that? And uh, that's why you drove in. That's swell. And you can make that out as soon as possible because now we'll have our gifts and our offerings and the choir will sing. And this number has thrilled me through the years, and it's worthy of the Lord Jesus, and it's called Behold the Lamb.
preparation for Easter is always accompanied by the beautiful lily. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And then the scripture says, especially clear in the Dutch translation, his coming again is as sure as the dawn. The Easter season, particularly at spring, brings this to light. And so I pray that as our worship continues, that the light of the gospel and the joy of new life in the promise of Christ, should you receive him into your life, will be like the flower blooming forever to the glory of God. Jesus Christ is risen. We hail him as our Lord and Savior, and we continue to worship him now with Nancy as she sings this marvelous number.
Could they keep him in the grave? Could they keep him in the grave? Could they keep him in the grave? The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most substantiated, reliable, historic fact in history. That's true because of three reasons, three ways you can know something. You can know something by intuition, by reasoning, or by common sense, we would say. It makes sense to me. And that's a personal decision that each person can make as a result of his reasoning capacity and the information that he has. I just have an intuition about it. Intuitions are never unsubstantiated, otherwise they would be dreams. They usually are credible in one way or another, at least from the eyewitness's viewpoint, because he has something to stand on or to go by. The next way determine reality is empiricism. Empiricism is the ability to come to reality by observable evidence and by experimentation. This is the scientific method. The empiricism style of learning and knowing is primary to all education and is really the linchpin of all research. The third way we come to knowledge, or we come to information, or we come to truth, or we come to reality, is mysticism. And mysticism is the, is the least reliable. Mysticism, in its purest definition, means to know something by contemplation or by meditation. It's extremely personal and never seeks to be replicated in others because it's primarily devoted to the conscience or the psyche and is not certainly part of observable data or by facts that can be collated or substantiated. The record that we have before us this morning, and I'm going to ask you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew 28, is a substantial piece of evidence. The documentation of what we're going to say this morning has its basis in writings. Now, everyone that writes something, this piece of writing can be translated. It also can be updated. History is moving so fast in our age of communication that very little seems to be worthy of documentation. But there are documenters all the time of course, now it's on software and many forms of, uh, of uh, a reliable uh, storage. But we must remember that in the first century, there was only papyrus or clay pottery. You hold in front of you a book called the Bible or the book, and the word comes from Byblos, which was a marshy area in the Middle East, and they took these reeds from this marshy area that was called Byblos, 
And they made like a mush or a mashed potato or a grits substance out of it. And then they would roll it out flat on racks. And when that thin uh, mashed reed would dry, it could be written on with dye. And it became what we would call papyrus. And before the Biblos, or the book, or the writings were put on paper, they were, of course, put on walls. Our present-day graffiti is a uh, perversion, in a way, of the writing on walls or inscription with hieroglyphic and paintings and so on that tell us about civilization. It is a miracle in and of itself that we have documents substantiated by manuscripts, the Vaticanus manuscript, which is in the Vatican, in the British Museum is uh, an equally substantiated and credible piece of document. And these are copies or manuscripts of the original texts. We don't have the original texts, but that is really not important. Because in the translation or in the copies over and over through the century, you would expect some corruption. Not only the details of the number of soldiers in the battle or times of days or the chronology and so on, but you would expect a substantial erosion of the integrity of the content of the message of these documents. The fact that we have them substantially proves that there has not been any corruption in faith or in doctrine. And one of the amazing substantiations of the reliability of this text that you hold in your hand this morning, of course, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, where we had a copy of the book of Isaiah that precedes the birth of Jesus Christ by 700 years. And not only by carbon dating and all of the technology to substantiate the age of anything, this shows us the copy of Isaiah that was copied 600 years before Jesus is born, that is now in the shrine of the book in the city of Jerusalem, and you can see it's behind bulletproof glass, is almost word for word the King James copy of the book of Isaiah that you have in your hand this morning. So these documents are reliable. People not only paid with their lives to copy them, but the message, and that's the heart of it because we are not worshipers of the Bible, But the message was so transforming, so amazing, so radicalized all of history that we dare to fill a church several times and we dare to worship in the highest form of praise of the Lord God whose story is documented in reliable substantiation in the Bibles that you hold. The text that we'll read this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, a follower of the Lord who was a financier and a tax collector in Jesus' time. Matthew, if you'll turn, please, to chapter 28. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, that would be early Sunday morning, the Sabbath was Saturday, came Mary Magdalene and another lady by the name of Mary to see the sepulcher. Now Mary was a convert of Christ. She had been demon-possessed. And they said that she had the perfect number of demons to make you really bizarre. And the Lord transformed her life, and she became a close follower of Christ. Those who love much follow the closest. And it is a wonderful tribute to womanhood that she came to the tomb and she followed the Savior. Because remember, in the first century, you could buy a woman cheaper than you could buy a mule. And you could buy a man for less than $20. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, $19.38. Women were less than beasts. And the fact that all women have some substantial equality, not total in the world today, is not to the credit of any religion or philosophy or society other than the teaching that comes from the Old Testament, the Judeo, and the Christian teachings, particularly of our Lord Jesus Christ because God came into the world through a woman. And that sanctifies the womb forever and makes the woman, especially the believer in the Lord Jesus, as Adam gave to Eve, the mother of us all. And so at Easter, there is a special tribute to women. Mary and the other 
Magdalene came to the sepulcher. They came to see it. They came to see it because it had been sealed, as we all know. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Not to hold it down, but to show that there was real authority here. And uh, the stone wasn't uh, rolled away to let the Savior out, but to let us all look in to see that it was empty. And his countenance was as lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, naturally, the keepers did shake. They shook with terror, the Bible says, and they collapsed. They became as dead persons. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, for behold, I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. Read the next line with me, please, aloud. For he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with awe and great joy. It outweighed all of their fear, and they did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell the disciples, take a look at this. That's the meaning of the word behold. Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Three thoughts this morning as you look at the Scripture together and as we become students for a few minutes. Three commands. Fear not. Come see. Go tell. Now, the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is magnificent because it's unprecedented. Unprecedented. There is no philosophy or religion or leader or anyone who has anything to say about anything in this age or in any age since the beginning of mankind than can give us proof of or dare to announce that he or that movement can conquer death and bring people back from death but the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus. And I say that without any thought of refutation. It is the truth. Only the message of Christianity, and I use it in the generic sense, only the Lord Jesus becomes the linchpin, the watershed, the hallmark, the essence, the epitome. And the Bible always says, He rose from the dead, from the dead, from the dead. So it's not like some spirit of Easter. Liberal theologians and many American pulpits will be filled with people today who will talk about the spirit of Easter and deny the, the divinity of Jesus Christ. There is no divinity if He is still dead. I remember when Carol and I were young with a family, and uh, Steve, our son, was about five or six at the time. We were in Florida, and we just went to the nearest church. And I'll never forget the pastor, denying the resurrection, spoke about Easter, and he had a southern accent. And for me, still in Philadelphia, it was as strange as Russian. And he said, Easter is bulbs and lilies and butterflies. And he kept saying that over and over again. I want to throw my Bible at him. <laughs> Jesus is risen from the dead. He was dead and he rose again. This is not a lie. You could not perpetuate such a prevarication. No one would believe it. And the testimony of the church today, not this church, but the church global the body of Jesus Christ, invisible and visible in what is called the Holy Church in the Bible. All of this, that it remains today in whatever form, is a verification of the unprecedented quality of the message of this season, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ bodily, visibly from the dead. It is unprecedented. And it is so uncomplicated. Come and see. You would think that the Scripture would say, believe, trust, follow, obey, words like that, which are generic to the Christian message. No, it just says, come and see. 
Don't take my word for it. Look at the documents. Read the text. Do the research. By whatever form of scientific observation, put it to the wall. Pin it down. Look at it. Come and see where the Lord lay. Fear not. Nothing to be afraid of. May I suggest this morning that there is everything to be afraid of. May I suggest not being morbid on this magnificent morning that there isn't anything that you can be sure of. And that's not pessimism, that's just reality. You cannot be sure of the weather. For a little while you can be. But then it takes even the weather persons by surprise. You cannot be sure of your health. All of us know that. All of us know that. Some foreboding, mysterious, unwelcomed, unjustified illness will seize us and grip us with no explanation. Even God won't give us an answer to our prayers. And death faces us all. Fifty, sixty, seventy years. Look at the obituaries in the paper. It seems they get younger all the time. Very few live to three score and ten. Very, very small percentage to eighty. And just a fraction, minuscule, you can't even chart it, like my father, who is 98. And I met a grandma as I came in this morning, 92. Very few like that. You come into the world naked and you go out naked. We're born to live. We're born to die. Inevitable, irreversible. It's there. Face it. Look at it. There's no hope and no confidence in life. Apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's nothing that is reliable. And that's what is making America so annoyed now. Before Japan and before the United States of Europe and before the exploding third world that seeks to be making demands on the rest of the world that are insatiable, before the population explosion, before the nuclear age, before of the global warning, before all of these things... In the world today, there is unprecedented annoyance, and Americans are annoyed. They're frustrated. They can't get a hold of it. And there's a suspicion in the back of the American psyche that it is even now too late. Prosperity is gone. Superpower. We can transform a battlefield into a victory with the smallest fraction of casualties. But all of us know, all of us know the insanity and the spread of these weapons around the world. And we don't want to hear it, and you don't like me to mention it, and it certainly isn't apropos on this Easter morning. But you must remember, without Jesus Christ, there's nothing sure. Nothing sure. Nothing is absolutely sure. In fact, the only thing sure about life is its end. It is appointed unto man. It's a destination. Once to die, and after this the evaluation, after this the final exams, the SAT scores are in, you will face God. The prophet said, prepare to meet your God, whether he's yours now or not, is irrelevant. You will face him, and every idle word you will record before him, and he will ask you, and the Bible says you will be naked and open before him with whom you have to do. I'm speaking to you this morning. Only with the resurrection of Jesus Christ is this uncomplicated, simple message relevant. He is not here. He is risen. Hallelujah. As He said, and that's the key, I wouldn't be a Christian if I found one contradiction in the words of Jesus Christ in the Bible. The resurrection of Jesus Christ makes sense. Why? Because it's compatible with everything He did. I would expect Him to be a resurrected Lord. I would not expect Him to be victimized by death. I would expect that if He is the God-man, He would conquer this thing that all of us fear the most. And imagine will never happen today. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. We never worship at the shrine of the empty tomb. There is no relic that we can hold up. All the relics and the shrines just a company. If they do, I think they're a waste of time. Most of them are silly. They do not make you a greater Christian. They do not give you greater faith. Anything, an object particularly that enhances your faith is 
bordering on idolatry. There is no place to worship today. He is alive. You worship Him here. He is with us in spirit and in truth. And He lives within our hearts. He is a living Lord, invisible. And you can worship Him. And no one will get confused over the object. Because He is pure and holy, He is the eternal God. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. He is risen. He tells the truth. He tells the truth. He is risen, as he said. He's the only person in all of history that predicted the exact details of his death and announced, imagine how absolutely ridiculous and blasphemous it was when he said, on the third day I will rise again. You can imagine somebody giggling in the crowd and somebody going home and saying, did you know what the Nazarene said today? He said he would rise again. Ha! Imagine that. But he did. He did. As he said, listen, the Lord Jesus keeps His Word. You can trust Him. Who can you really trust? The finest specialists or experts on psychology and friendship say, you are a rich man if you have five people in your life that you can really trust. You can trust Him. He can forgive you of all of your sins. He can expunge from the divine record at the, at the courtroom of heaven every act, nefarious, purposeful, accidental, or natural that you have ever committed that is an offense to God. Three words say this. The word is justified. It says in the book of Romans chapter 4 verse 23, we are justified by Jesus Christ who rose from the dead. Justification is the work by which God takes away all the evidence of your unlikeness to Him. Did you hear that? All the evidence of your unlikeness to Him. Justification. The next word is forgiveness. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Not only does He take away the evidence... But he pays the price for sin. There's a subtle thing. Listen to it carefully this morning. There may be a way in which it is right to say that God never forgives sin. He only forgives the sinner. Now listen, just for a minute, think about this message as well as I hope that you'll feel about it. God just can't forgive sin. I mean, he just can't forgive it. He can't say, okay, it's okay. It's all right. Listen, listen, I understand it all. Listen. My son was a man, and I'm a God, and I can do everything. I'll forgive sin. Listen, God can't do away with something that deserves judgments and punishments. It would be contrary to His perfect law of justice. That which is an offense must be removed. And the way you remove an offense is to have something that overshadows or outweighs or pays the price of the offense. All law is based upon that, whether it's 2 to 10, or 20 to 30, or 5 lifetime sentences, or you can be out in 36, whatever, there has to be a price to pay. So God judges sin, and on that basis, listen, He can forgive the sinner. And where did God pay the price for our offense? Breaking the law, rebelling against Him, living without Him, caring less other than a holy day like Christmas and Easter. Where we live like practical atheists, going our own way. And then when we get stuck or sick, or we run into financial difficulty, or something tragic happens to us, then we come to God. Then we come to God as if He's some kind of room service. God has to pay for our obnoxious behavior. He has to pay the price for the broken law of sin. How does He do that? Listen, the Gospel says He paid for it by giving His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in our place. Listen to it. Listen, listen, listen. Christ died for our sin. So the death of Christ not only takes away the evidence but takes away the obligation. And we are forgiven as sinners because God judged sin by allowing His Son to be the substitute for sin. 
Listen, the Lamb of God, they sang it. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Last night our family had lamb. The Passover, they had lamb and they roasted it and had potatoes and onions and vegetables. Some of you have seen it on television. And while they were eating the supper, they could hear the cries of the first animals and the first dogs and the first cats and the first uh, household pets and the firstborn were slain that night. But those that took the blood of the Lamb as they ate it, and they put the blood over the threshold and on the sides of the door, God said, if I see the blood of the Lamb that was shed for you as you eat it, as I see the blood, I will pass over you. And This weekend is the highest weekend in the history of Jewry. Passover, the Seder. You read about it in the paper this week. How wonderful that those who have been prohibited in the formal countries where there was such totalitarianism are celebrating the Passover, the deliverance of the Jews from bondage. And that's the Holy Communion. Take this cup, which is the blood that I shed for the remission of sins. Take this cracker, this unleavened biscuit, and eat it. This is my body. This is my blood, which is given for you. And now we can say the Passover, God has passed over judgment. John 5, 24. He that believeth on the Son shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The Passover, He died. The obligation is gone. In my place condemned He stood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Paul said Christ died for me. Hallelujah. He's a Savior. So we have justification and we have forgiveness. And then last of all, we have reconciliation bringing us back to God. And that's what you need this morning. Way up there on the second balcony. That's what you need. That's what you need. That's what you need. You need reconciliation with God. And by the cross, the two arms of the cross, they're brought to the center into the heart of Jesus. And Christ reconciles us back to God. He couldn't do it if He were dead. It'd just be a memory and a contradiction of all His words. The church would be a laugh. Our faith would be in vain. St. Paul said, when I preached, it would be like preaching air. Nobody would believe if Christ is not risen. Watch the phrase. From the dead, the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus, there is reconciliation. I saw a bumper sticker the other day, and it says, He who dies with the most toys wins. Most of us live that way. In the shock, as I came up to the bumper, I looked at it again, and then I grabbed a piece of paper and a pencil, and I wrote it down. He that dies with the most toys win. You're making all that money, and you're going to leave it to your children. You have no guarantee at all that they're going to live anything like you want them to live. They just live that way because you're now going to pass on the inheritance to them. You don't have any promise at all. Nothing. The grave will be sorrowful. You won't even know when you die. You'll be medicated. You won't have a chance then to repent. Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. Jesus said before He died the last week of His life, Now I will glorify the Son. And now is the prince of this world cast down. Speaking of Satan, Satan can do a lot of things. He can do miracles. He can heal. He even probably can walk on water. The Bible says the Antichrist will have such miracles. And through the technology of new television, you don't really know what's real or what is really just created by a computer. Imagine the Antichrist. All the world other than believers will worship him. The image of the ideal man. Lying wonders and miracles. But there's one thing he cannot do. In fact, he loves to do just the opposite. Jesus said he's a murderer from the beginning. He's a liar. He has come to steal, listen, and to kill and to destroy. The devil loves death. It's the only thing he has going for him. He loves violence and murder and abuse. Did you read the story of the man who was tried yesterday and let off about this marital rape situation? He loves that. That's the devil's work. You can always tell it. The abuse and the hatred and the hurt all comes from the evil one. 
not from Jesus Christ. He's life. He's life. Satan says, I've come to bring death. The Bible says he has death in his hands. He loves to murder. All wars come from him. He loves it all. And the Bible says, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. How could he give it away? If he was still in some Syrian tomb, he couldn't. But he is alive forevermore. He is not here. You didn't expect him to be here, did you? He is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay and go and tell everybody else. Reconciliation. So the gospel of Jesus Christ does three things this morning. Number one, it gives us power over death. Number two, it pardons all of our sin. And number three, it gives us purpose in life. Tell everybody there's nothing to be afraid of. Not even death. He's alive. If we ever shouted, if we ever sang, if we ever said, Happy Easter, it's because Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. And so the hymn says, I serve. I've got purpose in life. I serve the risen Savior. He's in the world today. Through intuition, to empiricism, you may even think I'm a kooky mystic. But I know He lives. He lives in my heart. My life has been changed. Follow Him, too. Love Him, too. Believe in Him, too. Go into all the world and preach this good message to every creature. The applicability of the gospel is the uniqueness of it. All other religions, you can't sell them. You can't market them. They're not applicable. All people can't understand it. And only few people really get it. Not with the gospel. The gospel is whoever will. Come. Whoever won't. The consequences and the results are yours. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and God will abundantly pardon. But the wicked shall be cast into hell and all the nations that forget God. The option is so wonderful. The message is so uncomplicated. The invitation is so universal. Whosoever will may come. Come see. Go tell. Don't be afraid. I think I've told this story several years ago. Now being here almost 20 years, I'm sure I've told it before. But you probably forgot it. I just remembered it yesterday. The story of George Wilson, who was sentenced to die in the New York State Prison at Sing Sing years ago. And for some reason or other, the governor decided to release him and pardon him. Not through any extenuating circumstances. He just wanted to pardon George Wilson. And for the first time, 75 years ago, for the first time, a man who was sentenced to die without any computation or with anything that would release him sentenced to die when the pardon was offered to George Wilson. This is a historic story. Mr. Wilson said, no, I don't want it. And the first time in the courts of the United States, they had to make a decision. If a man refuses the pardon, what must the state do? And the law stands today. If you refuse the pardon, you must die. How foolish. The pardon is yours. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. Jesus Christ came into the world to save you, to forgive you of your sins, and to give you the hope beyond the grave because Jesus Christ died and rose again. The pardon, the offer, the invitation is for you. The question is, will you reject the pardon? Or will you receive it? The document's reliable. The message is viable. Everybody can live it. It's a transforming experience. It determines your destiny. It's up to you. Don't be afraid. There's nothing like it. Come and see for yourself. And when you receive it, go tell. Go tell. 
The Lord is risen. Help me. The Lord is risen indeed. Let's pray. (laughs) Father God, we praise Thee and thank Thee this morning for this irrefutable, immensely, immensely believable message of Him who is with us even this morning. We bless Your holy name and ask that many hearts will be open to receive Your Son as Lord and Savior. And while we're bowed in prayer in this final moment of contemplation, I wonder how many, how many this morning, there were some at the sunrise service, how many would just say, you know, I finally see the light, I I, I clearly understand it, I don't understand it all, but if Christ died for my sins and God would let me off the hook, and I could be brought back to God, the word is reconciliation, and I could go to heaven, I would be foolish not to receive that. You're right. You're right. You would be. And you might be saying this morning, I'd like to receive Him as my Lord and Savior. I would like to have Him in my life. I would like to know Him for sure. I'm in doubt this morning. But somehow this morning I've felt my heart strangely warmed. I'm not asking you to join the church or give anything or sign anything. I'm not even going to have you come forward this morning in an open invitation, but right there, right where you are. I wonder how many would say by lifting up your hand, let's let's take the organ side first. No one's looking, not even the pastors. How many would just lift up your hand and say, Ross, this morning I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I receive Him. I'm going to give Him my life and my heart. Here's my hand. I receive the risen Christ. How many on that side? Just that section alone. God bless you, sir. God bless you. May the Lord bless you, and He will. My words don't bless you, but God will. Here's my hand. I want to know Christ for sure as my Savior. The risen Lord. I will accept Him in my life. In the balcony, those up there, thank the Lord. In the center section, right here in front of me, within eye contact, way back there, And over here, and right there, thank the Lord. Right there, sir, God bless you. Now now the piano side, the 51 side, there, how many? Here's my hand. I want to receive Christ. I know the story, but this morning I invite Him into my life. I bond with Him. Here's my hand. Pray for me. How many there? There and there and balcony. Ushers, help me. Any up there? God bless you, sir. Way there. Ah, wonderful. And one here. Thank the Lord. Now, all of you who are believers, will you pray that that the hearts of these will be closed now by the Holy Spirit as the surgeon has opened their hearts. Now that the Holy Spirit would close their hearts, that the gospel would grow and take root. If you've received Christ and raised your hand, will you pray this little prayer just in your heart, not out loud, following my prayer? Pray, dear Lord, right now, I receive you who died for me and who rose again. Make me a real Christian, for I now acknowledge you and give you my life as the risen Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing one verse of Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior. Up from the grave he arose, 216 in our hymn books, and the choir will come and take their places for what Carol and I believe is the best and finest way, and many of you do as well, to close any service, but particularly Easter, by the singing of the Hallelujah Chorus. And we'll ask you to stay in place, please, until the last great note of this traditional number to the glory of the Messiah and our Lord. 216, Ron, you lead us, and uh, we will stand as we sing.
trust us with your commitment so that we can send you some literature and encourage you by mail or personally. If you made an open confession of Christ as Lord this morning, speak to me in the Galleria. I'll be there at the end of both services and tonight. Or jot your name and phone number. We'll call you personally and follow you up in your commitment. And if you came with those who are believers over lunch or on the way out, tell them of your decision. And that'll be the first wonderful thing that you will do to perpetuate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid. Come and see. Go and tell. Tell someone today of your faith in Christ. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless one and all.